Our trip across the Atlantic was a real holiday. Fine weather and a calm sea allowed us to enjoy it to the full. New sights were a grand experience. My small family expected Dad to be an encyclopedia and kept me busy explaining various things they saw, which included a school of seals, the rocky north coast of Ireland, an iceberg, and the ship itself. Coming up the St. Lawrence was marred by a dense fog, which lifted in time for us to see Quebec with its bridges. Passing to the doctors and the customs was a heartbreaking affair, as the crowd was too heavy for the officials to handle. The Red Cross, however, took care of the wife and children while I attended to the luggage, which took me four hours to get away. We followed by a later train, which only stopped twice before reaching Winnipeg. And even at that, it took four days, days which are far too much for the children, as we were on the north route, and there was only the same to see each day, rocks and trees and more trees, until the last day when the farms began to appear. The frost was, however, not out of the ground, so no work was being done, and this was a surprise to me, for at that time I did not understand the climate. After only a few hours in Winnipeg, we entrained for a further 450 miles, which brought us to a small place called Prairie River. After a wagon trip of 12 miles through a forest, we arrived at the settlement, the end of our journey of 14 days. It was a great relief to us all when we got a real tubbing and a good bed at a small Red Cross outpost. I may say here that the government had planned the trip as well as we had expected. This settlement was a huge tract of land inside the Porcupine Forest and was first opened in 1919 for returned men, some of whom abandoned their portions, which were now being filled up by the 3,000 family scheme. Each piece of land consisted of 240 acres covered with poplars and willow bush. The poplars ranged from 2 to 8 inches in thickness and up to 40 feet in height. The willows grow in clumps as high as 12 feet. Our homestead had a house, barn, granary, and a chicken house already built upon it, and we had 20 acres of land broken, ready for cultivation. One year was allowed to us to decide whether we wished to stay on this place or to try another, which we considered better. We stayed on the original one. The loan from the British government was 300 pounds, which was spent as we needed on stock and implements at the discretion of the district supervisor. We spent ours on four cows, two horses, one mule, a plow, harrows, drill, binder, 12 hens, a cock, and various other farm equipment. This loan is split up into 25 annual payments, so it's not a great burden. The farmland was priced at a low figure by the Canadian government, and the payments for it were also spread over 25 years. Owing to the depression, both governments have made it easier for us, cancelling interests. Also, the whole annual payment for 1932 was struck off. Since then, we have a further concession, as every dollar we pay, the Canadian government pays one. This will last till 1936, so you see we have a real chance to become landowners and an asset to our adopted country. There is quite a different method of farming in this country. In fact, I had to learn over again new ways of farming and new names for things. Let us take a spring to winter's work. After the frost gets out of the ground six inches and the snow water having disappeared, we start to plow. The smallest plow is a gang plow, which turns over two furrows of 14 inches. It has a seat to ride on and is drawn by four horses. The usual day's work is to plow five acres, but there are larger plows which take eight horses to draw them. Young men here think it nothing to drive eight horses at a time. The most I have driven at any time was six, but even then, I had to learn how to hitch them up and keep them and the plow under control. When the land is plowed, it is then disc harrowed. This cuts the land up and the flat harrows over once make it ready for the drill. Here again we have to learn a lesson, for the drills here are larger, taking four to six or even eight horses, but only one man to a drill. But things have to be big, for the season is short, and once the seed is in it comes up quickly. Wheat takes 110 days to ripen, oats 90 days, and barley 60 to 75 days. The binders then began to hum, and it does not take long, for the binder takes 8 feet at a time, and that is a small binder, a large one has 14 feet of cutting bars. There is a carrier on the binder which carries the sheaves to the rows for stooking, which makes it so easy for the man who is stooking that he's able to stook 20 or more acres a day. As soon as possible, the crop is threshed straight from the field. These threshing outfits go from farm to farm. They have around 12 wagon racks with each machine, and they thresh from 75 to 80 acres a day. 
On the prairie, they have the combine, which cuts the crop and threshes it at the same time. This, of course, is drawn by a tractor. The only other crops we were able to grow up here are clover and hay, and they do grow. Last year, I had clover six feet high when it was cut in June. Root crops grow real well too, but we have no time in the fall to harvest many as the frost comes so early and stops everything. However, we grow wonderful gardens. Tomatoes and cucumbers ripen outside and all the usual garden truck. Fruit trees are absent as yet, but the experimental farms which are maintained by the government are getting even those to live. Small fruits grow wild, gooseberries, black and red currants, raspberries, strawberries, mossberries, and cranberries. We are also trying a few hybrid plums and cherries, but we have not had them long enough to pass the test. The greatest change we have got to get used to is the climate. Spring comes in with April and the snow, which is usually from three to four feet deep, thaws and causes all the creeks and rivers to flood. Thus it is the month of May before we can get on the land. By June the hot weather comes. July brings 102 in the shade at times, with August much the same. During September it cools off a little, and October again brings winter, for as a rule by the last of this month everything is frozen solid. In November, snow and cold come again, and we often get it 60 below zero in December and January. February and March are just fair, the average being below zero. Most of our rain comes at the end of June and the end of July with odd thunderstorm in August. From this account, you will get some idea of one of the changes to which we have become accustomed. Now I will go back to ourselves. We were put on the usual portion of 240 acres of land covered with bush. The house was a small but well-built two-roomed wooden building and contained a cooking stove, bed, couch, table, and two forms. The wife brought a stock of provisions and various household necessities on the way, so we had enough to go on with for a while. For a while we were too busy getting things to our liking to really think about England, and our enthusiasm glossed over parts. A small garden patch had been cleared, and that occupied our attention for a while. I was found clearing land at various places during the summer, wages being $2 a day. In my spare time, I dug a cellar under the house and a well just outside. With one cow and a few chickens, we bravely made a start. The first fall we were here, I went down to the prairies for six weeks, harvesting, and as well as making enough cash to last us the winter, I gained a great deal of experience. That same summer, the Canadian government had 20 acres of land broken for me, which meant starting on my own in 1928. Therefore, early in that year, we applied for and got three more cows, a mule, and two horses. I put this 20 acres into oats in order to have feed for my stock the following winter, and this paid us for the cows milked well, and we shipped the cream to the creamery, thereby making our living. Since that time, we have gone ahead as fast as possible. I did not borrow any more money after 1928, so my improvements came slowly. In order that you will understand certain things to which we have to accommodate ourselves, I will first give an outline of the district. The homesteads, or farms, are scattered far and wide, our nearest neighbor being half a mile away, and the next one a mile. That is the usual way throughout the settlement. Our nearest store, or shop, is four miles away, and it is the only one nearer than ten miles away. Church is four and a half miles away, and the Red Cross outpost, with only two nurses in attendance and no doctor, is four miles. The nearest railway is twelve miles away, and that has only one train each way a week. The railway on the north side is 15 and a half miles away, but has three trains each way per week. Our nearest town is Tisdale, which is 140 miles away. At Tisdale, we have our nearest doctor, hospital with x-ray equipment, and a full staff of nurses operated by the St. Teresa's nuns. This town also contains our nearest cinema. We have only one road out of the settlement over which cars can travel, weather permitting. After being used to a country village which had good roads to a town only five miles away, it took us quite a while to get used to our isolation and into the habit of ordering our provisions in the bulk. We buy flour in hundredweight sacks, and we usually get five sacks at a time, sugar in hundred-pound lots, salt in fifty-pound lots, and most other things accordingly. We have no meat store, but we have no difficulty here, for the women can meat for summer use and also salt bacon. Lots of eggs are used for summer meals, so that helps out quite a lot. It is easy to keep meat in the winter, of course, for when hung in the granary it freezes as hard as a rock. Our vegetables are stored in a cellar under the house along with fruits, jams, pickles, the former being canned. The canning of these has to be learned by the women. It is a process of putting fruits, meats, etc. into glass jars called sealers and sterilizing the whole by boiling for a certain number of hours. 
Bread making is another thing the women have to relearn, for we have no yeast as yeast is known in England. The yeast cakes we have here will keep indefinitely, and before use they have to be soaked in water which has had potatoes boiled in it, a sprinkling of sugar is added, and boiled milk is used in the making up of the dough. The first time or so it is usually a failure for women who have been used to the English method, but they soon get onto the idea. My wife can now make the bread as well as she did when she was in England, our home, for I still call it home. Do we live better than we did in England? Is a question you may ask at this point. Without hesitation, I answer yes. We do not get any fancy stuffs, but the things we eat are more pure, as for instance the flour is pure white flour by law, and no margarine is allowed in the country. We make our own butter, of course. We have only bought two pounds since we came to this country. Gardens, as I have already shown, supply much, and apples, plums, etc. can be bought at a fair price in season, and then can for later use. Our meat is raised on the place except the wild, of which there are deer, moose, elk, and bears. The bears are a harmless variety, both black and brown. There are game birds, such as prairie chicken, like a grouse, only larger, and it is no new sight to see as many as 50 in our yard ptarmigan, or arctic grouse, come here for the winter. Partridges, the same as you have in the stubble fields. From spring to late fall, we have all species of ducks, by the hundreds they come, also three kinds of wild geese and wild turkeys. Hunting is a great sport for those who care for it, you will see, but the law only allows a person to kill what a family can use, and one can be sold. This law has been a great blessing as it tends to keep game plentiful. Hunters from other countries buy a permit which allows them to bag one head of the animal game and that one to be a male. Of the game birds, various numbers are allotted. The hunters are a source of revenue both to settlers and to the government. They pay well for guides and the foodstuffs we can sell them. Another source of income is from the trapping of furs, for we have ermine, red and black fox, mink, skunk, coyote, and the muskrat. Trapping, of course, is an art in itself, and it is only the odd person who can make a living at it. Now to our pleasures. In summer, every school holds a picnic at which we have races for the children in pillow fights and jumping in such events for men and women. Baseball tournaments are played by the young men, and various charitable organizations such as the Church WA and Red Cross workers hold sideshow attractions. We also have an agricultural society which holds one show per year for the showing of livestock, field crops, and garden. They also have contests for ladies' work such as canning, sewing, garden stuff, bread, and butter making. The children also have a section for woodwork, doll dressing, cooking, sewing, and darning. They also have a calf rearing competition for both boys and girls. Eric, my old the oldest boy was placed sixth with his calf, and all three of my children were in the prize list for some entry or other. This helps the kiddies quite a lot in experience, and also teaches them to lose with a smile. Our winter sports are curtailed to parties, musical evenings, and whist drives which are held at each home in turn. For the more energetic there is skating, ice hockey, skiing, and tobogganing. There is one more thing of importance to any family coming out here, and that is education. Our schools are placed as near as possible in the center of a block of land six miles square, and this means that some of the children have a long way to go both morning and night, but it is no great hardship for most of them to go on horseback in the summer and horse-drawn toboggan in winter. There is a barn at every school to accommodate the horses. Children do not start school until they are seven and pass out after grade eight examination or at the 15 years of age, but he may carry on if he cares to until he passes an examination, which entitles him to attend normal school school or college. Our colleges are also far, far cheaper places to attend than they were back home. We also have short course training sessions at the university, which consist of a thorough course over a period of three months in the winter in any one subject, and these are excellent for budding young farmers for such things as vet work, motor mechanics, etc., which are a great help on a farm. The way the money is raised for the running of our schools is by levying a tax on each farm, and each taxpayer is allowed to pass his opinion and vote on any change which is needed once a year. This keeps expenses down to the minimum. For the last three years, my school tax has been $16.70 a year, so you see it's not a hard tax to pay. The only other tax we pay on our farms is the municipal tax for road work, etc. It costs about $12 a year. 
Before I pass on to the children in schooling, let me state this is a fine country for them, for they are fine, healthy children. They live clean lives, learn at an early age to be kind to animals. They do not want pleasures of city life because they do not know them. Most of them are musical, stringed instruments being found in nearly every home, as well as a good gramophone or radio. We have no public houses, and the sale of liquor is carried on only by the government. Our nearest liquor store is 140 miles away. An English person is sure to miss the songbirds out here. We have none. With the exception of the game birds I've mentioned and a few sparrows which stay in the barn, the whole bird family migrate, only staying long enough in these parts to raise their young. But the colors of some of the birds are wonderful. Wings of scarlet, pure yellow orioles. In fact, we see birds of every color. The hummingbirds are a poem to watch. These little birds come all the way from South America. What a lesson of endurance, if we only wish to learn it. Another thing which is often remarked upon is the absence of scent to flowers. I suppose we have every variety of wild flowers. Violets grow in masses, purple and white. Tiger lilies grow wild and are the most beautiful table flowers, lasting a week or more in a vase of water. Unfortunately, the life of these flowers is short, for they are only with us during May, June, and July. Well, sir, I have really allowed my pen to take me a long way. I had no idea of carrying on like this when I started. Still, it may give you an idea of what we do, how we live, and what my family may think of it. To your question, do we like this life, I can truthfully say yes. Both the wife and I are able to say it emphatically. As for the children, they are surely a happy bunch, which along with the good health they enjoy, is all that matters for a while to them and to us as their parents. Remember this letter only covers the province of Saskatchewan and the Porcupine Settlement in particular. As for your question, does the life compare with the small holders in England, my vote goes for the Canadian homestead. We have not the great overhead charges annually. Our life is more free, and though we work hard during the summer, we sit around the heater a good deal in the winter with books for companions. Our fuel is wood, which costs only the work to get it. We have a voice in all community works. There is no distinction between rich and poor. The usual villa gossip of England is unknown, and we try to work one with another.